In the previous episode, we examined the moons of Jupiter and saw clear evidence of expansion on not only Europa, but Ganymede as well. In this episode, I want to explore whether that holds true for the moons of Saturn and beyond. Let's start by examining Mimas, the closest moon that sits outside of its rings. It is a very small moon at only 400 kilometers in diameter. Interestingly, it is the smallest astronomical body known to still be rounded in shape. It is thought to be composed of mainly water ice with only a small amount of rock. It has a large feature which measures 130 kilometers across that is thought to be the site of a giant impact crater. This feature is something that we will see on other moons too. If it was caused by an asteroid impact, at nearly a third the size of Mimas, surely it would have shattered it. There are some signs of cracks on the opposite side of this crater, which are thought to be due to the shock wave from the impact. The surface itself is littered with craters, except around the crater site itself. So here there really isn't strong evidence for any expansion, at least not in the most recent past. Let's move on to examine the next moon, Enceladus. Now it should come as no surprise that this moon is very similar to Europa. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It is, however, only about 500 kilometers in diameter. The surface itself is considered to be covered in fresh, clean, reflective ice, making it one of the most reflective bodies in our solar system. It is considered to be geologically active with visible hot regions in the southern pole. They have also detected complex macromolecular organics in the plumes that have been ejected from the surface. So is there evidence of an expansion? If we start by examining a map of the entire surface, there are two striking features. On both the right and left hand side, there are areas of newer cracked surface, which is surrounded by an older cratered surface. The right hand side version has a very circular shape where the cracks themselves also seem to follow this circular pattern. This reminds me to some extent of the crater that we saw on Callisto. The left hand side is more square with straighter lines seemingly intersecting at right angles. There is some shape conformity between the shape at the top of this rectangle and the vertical lines would tend to suggest that the motion wasn't simply a north-south displacement. If we cut out the section which is older from the north through the centerpiece, then I can show one possible way that this may have moved. You will see that the edge seems to align with some of the crack marks along the way. As we slowly rotate it, you will see various cracks seem to line up with others that previously just terminated abruptly. You will also see ridges that seem to conform to the outline. Now it is important to realize that in this movement, the top section would have pulled the material above it with it. Now this is nowhere near as clean as when we examined Ganymede. And I will admit that this movement I have shown is not as clear as other examples and may well just be a coincidence. So let's examine the surface features in more detail. Examining the North and South Poles reveals that the majority of the cracks are appearing in the Southern Pole over the hot spot. The North Pole looks much older in comparison. Large cracks are crisscrossed with many smaller ones, almost like a root system. If we examine an image showing the central band of craters that we previously looked at, in between the two areas that potentially identify an expansion area, then initially you would say it is not obvious that there is an expansion. But if you examine the craters at the edge on both sides of the rift, then you will start to notice that some of these seem to be cut in half. If we move the section higher, we can get a perfect alignment of all of these craters. If we examine the right hand side, you will notice a large band of rift expansion with what appears as a central island. So was this torn off from the top side? If we move this piece upwards, we find an almost perfect alignment with the other side. We are now left with a large triangular wedge to the side. If this was expanded out in all directions, then this side should also align with the surface on this side. Again, if we take a copy and rotate it, we find the side aligns almost perfectly once more. 
Here is another example of those large cracks, and again we can easily align the cracks to meet them perfectly. Let's move on to examine the next moon outwards, Tethys. Once more, the moon size has increased to just over a thousand kilometers. It has a very low density, and this is the lowest density of all the major moons in the solar system. Once again, it is thought that it is composed of mainly water ice with just a small fraction of rock. The surface is heavily cratered and cut by a number of large faults. The largest impact crater is about 400 kilometers in diameter, which puts it close to the same ratio as the Mimas crater we previously looked at. There does not appear to be any areas of fresh expansion, suggesting it has been inactive for a while. If we examine the large rifts that exist on one side of the moon, it is possible to show that there is shape conformity from one side to the other, suggesting this shows an area of expansion. By moving this section over we can see conformity, but you will also notice that these ripples continue way beyond this. You will also notice that the section in the south curves downwards and we see features that match the move section. This may suggest that some of the features we are seeing on the surface are created through this process, possibly welling up and creating a feature which then causes a tear and this then repeats on a varying timescale. Of course, our eyes are very good at matching patterns, so you could equally argue that if you move it far enough, you will always find matches. I certainly think there are strong matches across the ridge with hints of features matching a little further out. Beyond that, I think at this stage, it is more guesswork. Let's move on and examine Dion, which once again is a little larger at 1122 kilometers in diameter. It is a very massive moon of which two thirds is thought to be water ice and the remaining a dense core. Data from Cassini indicates that it has an internal liquid salt water ocean similar to Enceladus. One hemisphere is heavily cratered and the other has a network of bright ice cliffs. The two hemispheres are very distinctive. The leading one shows what appears as a large fissure but also contains less craters. What is interesting is that these fissures seem to have perpendicular lines etched along them as well. When we examine the other hemisphere we see fissures that appear much sharper and yet it has a larger number of craters. We once more see areas where the fissures have perpendicular lines running alongside them, but if we examine the edges of these cracks, we see some areas of strong conformity, and equally areas where there is no strong conformity, even across small distances. Now something that I have wondered about is what initiates an expansion. If we examine Europa and Enceladus, then the electric universe would tell us that these channels are cut via electrical discharge carving out vast amounts of material. I have shown many examples where there is very strong shape conformity across large distances, meaning the material cannot simply be etched away. But what if both were possible? What if the electrical discharge along the surface etched out enough material or weakened the crust enough to cause the crust to shift? If there was an internal pressure that would cause the crack to quickly propagate and expand? Are some moons under less pressure to expand? Is this what we see here, electrical etching across the surface is removing material which is only causing an expansion in small areas, otherwise the etching causes surfaces that do not match. Let's continue outwards and look at Rhea, which is a very similar story to Dion. We see rifts across the surface with some strong conformity, but the distance is small suggesting a very small expansion. Next out is Titan, but here the surface images are not good enough to really show any expansion or conformity. Moving a little further out, we end up with Iapetus, probably one of the strangest moons of Saturn, as it once more has a very large crater, but this time it also has an equatorial bulge that runs around three quarters of it. It is a low density moon once more thought to be composed of ice. The surface is heavily cratered with some very large crater areas visible, once more very similar to the other moons we have looked at. One hemisphere is noticeably darker than the other. The equatorial ridge that runs along the equator is up to 20 kilometers wide 
and 13 kilometers tall. It is not clear how this ridge formed. There are some ridges that are cut into the surface, but the images are not clear enough to make out the detail of these, and there does not appear to be many of them suggesting that this moon does not show signs of expansion. But maybe the equatorial bulge is a sign of contraction? What is odd about the bulge is how perfectly it runs along the equator. So what about the other outer planets? Let's quickly take a look at Neptune's moon Triton. It is the largest moon of Neptune, and the others are much smaller, so we'll only look at this one. It is about 2,700 kilometers in diameter, and it's thought to have a surface of mostly frozen nitrogen and mostly water ice crust, an icy mantle and a substantial core of rock or metal. It does have an atmosphere and clouds have been observed. Only 40% of its surface was photographed by Voyager 2, but this revealed blocky outcrops, ridges, troughs, furrows, hollows and icy plains with very few craters. When we examine the images, we clearly see similar patterns to those we saw on Europa and Ganymede. It would appear in these images that the southern hemisphere may be the older surface with cracked veins showing where expansion may have taken place. It is possible to see some very rough conformity, but without more detailed images, it is not really possible to say whether this is due to expansion or simply the breakup of existing slabs. Moving on to Uranus, we have four moons that are worth looking at. Let's start with Miranda. This is the smallest moon. It is just 470 kilometers in diameter. And once more, we have an inner core with a mantle of ice. The images really speak for themselves as we see all the patterns we have looked at previously but this is a very extreme example, suggesting a lot of expansion and relatively recent as the surface is not that cratered compared to the other examples we have looked at. Next up is Ariel, which has a diameter of about 1200 kilometers and once more has a mantle of ice with an inner core of rock. Again, here we can clearly see larger cracks across the surface that show very nice conformity, suggesting once more an expansion process. Moving further out, we have Umbriel, which is a similar size to Ariel and is thought to mainly consist of water ice with once more a dense core. Unfortunately, there are not many images and the ones that there are are very blurry. We can see evidence of craters and what appears like a larger one on the northern pole with what appears as a ring of brighter material. From the images, it is not possible to make out any surface features which may indicate expansion. Next out is Titania, which has a diameter of 1600 kilometers and is the largest of the Uranian moons. Again, it is considered to have a water ice mantle with a dense core. Images of the surface show a much less cratered surface and some very large cracks across the surface. We are once more limited in terms of the number of images, but the cracks do show good shape conformity, but it is not possible to see the entire surface to gauge the level of expansion and possible direction of this. Lastly, there is Oberon, which is only slightly smaller than Titania and is thought to consist of equal quantities of ice and rock. The surface is covered in some larger craters and contains large cracks that are thought to have occurred as a result of an expansion of its interior during its early evolution. But the image is too small and blurry for me to make out any of the details. So far we have seen that all the moons have an icy mantle and that many have shown features of expansion. For some of these moons the accepted theory does indeed include a small expansion of the moon by about 5%, which could indeed account for the smaller cracks that we have seen on some of the moons, but cannot account for some of the moons that seem to show very large areas of expansion. So far all of our examples have been icy planets. In the next episode, we will examine the inner solar system and see how these compare to what we have seen or whether this is a totally different story when we examine non-icy bodies. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.